So it says your friend had a room, and you wanted to make it into a man cave, something in the style of John Wick. And you had a month to design and build the whole thing. So did you do it? Yeah. So yeah, my friend had a room in his basement. It was a junk room. This is what it looked like before we started. Now, for the design, I wanted to come up with something that was instantly recognizable for John Wick fans, but then also cool for people who weren't. And so I figured, how about Winston's vault room in the basement of the Continental? It's totally iconic. It's a great looking room. Now, the challenge was going to be the room in the film is a big room with a tall ceiling. And this was a small room with a low ceiling. So I knew I was going to have to be really conscientious about the proportions. So I began reviewing images from the film, deciding which features I wanted to incorporate into the design. And there's a few that stuck out right away. These iconic columns next to each of the doors and along the windows with the ironwork on them and the, the rope details had to have that. Of course, the pattern tiled ceiling, that was gonna be important. Those vaults that are on the back wall wanted those. Definitely had to have the big gun circle, the gun cabinets. I wanted to do the floor exactly because that's a huge part of the look these rorschach paintings there was all this decorative filigree stuff wanted to do the vault door for the closet the other thing he wanted was a pool table and the truth was there really wasn't room for it but we put it in anyway and it actually worked out fine it's to, to give a little handicap if you're shooting from the side but other than that it's it's really okay when modeling these pieces, I obviously try to be as accurate as I can to the film, but then also conscious about how we're actually going to build them. And I knew right away a lot of these things were going to be MDF, the ironwork would be real iron. I wasn't sure how we were going to do the floor yet, but I could tell that there was a, a few different solutions that would work, so I felt confident putting that in the design. I also realized we had room for a small Chesterfield couch and a chair, which would be great. I wanted to do the original coffee table. I found the original coffee table in New York, but it was it was $11,000. So I didn't do that. And this is my final design for how the room would look when it was all together. With the design locked, it was time to start building. And this was a family affair. We got everybody involved, the wives, the kids, which is great. I love having the kids involved. I love teaching them about design and about construction and also about OSHA violations. <laughs> all the pieces as kits that could easily be put together assembly line style so the kids could each work on a part of it and then just move it up the chain move it you know and then this way they were consistent and they were easy to put together and it actually went very very quickly so at this point it was just days of hammering and nailing gluing painting and assembling in researching the original production design, I discovered that the floor was actually printed. It was a printed floor. And that gave me the idea of maybe doing it ourselves out of a, like a robust outdoor vinyl, which is actually what we ended up doing, it's a big sticker. And it allowed me to get the design nailed. I was able to scan pieces of marble and tile and assemble a collage of those pieces to get the pattern exactly right. When I build things in the computer, in CAD, one thing I try to do is I actually try to build it in the computer virtually the same way we're actually gonna build it in the real world. For example, if we know we're gonna use four by eight sheets of half inch MDF, I'll build it out of sheets of MDF virtually, which gives us a good idea for a list of materials and early projections on costs that are usually pretty accurate. So that's really, really a useful part of working out all the details prior to the build. Assembling the floor vinyl was tricky, there's no question about it, because we wanted it to be absolutely seamless. It just took some conscientious time. It ended up looking even better than I expected. And as soon as that was done, and the color on the walls had come together, you could really feel the space starting to gel. Ultimately, we put hidden speakers in the columns to play back sound from the record player and the sound system. 
And then the two Rorschach paintings are on the opposite wall. One of them is just a painting. The other one is also another false door that goes into a closet. And it occurred to me at one point that we should have my friend's two sons actually make their own ink blots. And then I would colorize them and put them up. And then this way there'd be this this personal detail right from his own two boys on the on the walls in the room. We ended up doing that and it worked out great and it's just a cool thing for them every time they, they come in. Finishing touches like the perimeter lights that were behind the frieze and the overhead lights and of course the chandelier. We found sort of an art deco-ish sort of chandelier above the pool table. As each one of these pieces came in, it was just getting cooler and cooler to see and harder and harder to work because you just wanted to hang out in the room. It's always hard coming to the end of a project like this because you've put all this personal energy into it and of course you can think of all kinds of ways to improve it and upgrade it. But also you have to face the fact that it's, it's not yours. It's for someone else. Whether you're writing music for their film or designing a room for their home, there just comes the moment which you realize you have to say goodbye. But that's, that's the life. That's part of what it means to be a creative professional. It's a service business. It's a creative service business. I have served. I will be of service. <laughs>